Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today evening. And I'll speak on the topic of how our home in this world can take us to a home beyond this world. So I'll talk this based on the Srimad Bhagavatam, the second canto. There's a verse which says, Dhautatma Purushaha Krishna Padamulam Namunchati Mukta Sarvapari Kleshaha Panthaha Svasharanam Yatha <coughs> says that Dhautatma, that person, that soul who is purified, Krishna Padamulam, that soul never leaves the lotus feet of Krishna, always stays sheltered in God. Why? Namunchati never gives it up. Because in that, in that absorbed devotion to God, Mukta Sarva Pariklesha had become free from all distress. The, as Pantaha Swasharanam Yatha. Just as a person who has gone on a long and tiring tour, when they come back home, Swasharanam Yatha. Just as they feel relieved and happy when they come back home, like that, the purified souls feels happy when they are at the feet of Krishna. And so, so this verse basically tells that just as we can get shelter in our home in this world, we can get shelter in God similarly beyond this world. So I'll talk about this in three broad parts. First, I'll talk about the how we all long for a shelter, for a home. Then I'll talk about how the ultimate shelter is to be found beyond this world. And then I'll talk about how our shelter in this world can point us or take us to the shelter beyond this world. <clears throat> Across the world, human beings have many differences. Say differences in what kind of food people eat, different kind of, uh, say, how people dress. So even when you're talking with people in different cultures, how much distance you keep between two people talking with each other, that's also different. Sometimes, you know, in some cultures, people you keep a little distance and then you talk. In other cultures, you come very close. And if two people are from the different cultures, like that, one culture where the space is a lot, the space is more, and other culture, the space is less. It's almost like, when the two people are talking, the first person is moving forward, the second person is moving back. The first person is moving forward, the second person is moving back. <laughs> so, they feel uncomfortable. Why are you coming so close? And the other person feels uncomfortable. Why are you going so far away? <laughs> so, like that, there can be many differences in the way people live. But across the world, people have certain common aspirations. And one of those aspirations is the aspiration for a home a place where we can where we can just be comfortable we can feel safe we can feel a sense of belonging where we can be loved in fact that feeling is so deep rooted that there's even a phrase out of it feel at home here when you say somebody some guest has come feel at home here that means just be comfortable here treat it like your own home the idea is Home is a place where we feel comforted. Now, we've, now, life is tough. Everybody has challenges. Even if people are, look very successful, very happy, if you just scrape a little below the surface, everybody is working through their own tragedies. Maybe somebody has just lost their job, somebody has got a terrible disease, Somebody, the relationship is just going downhill. Somebody's ch ch maybe child has got caught in some drugs or something like that. So many people, problems people have. So it's almost like the world is like a battlefield where problems can attack us from various sides. So even when soldiers are fighting a war, they need a camp where they can rest, they can recuperate. So the world is like a battlefield 
and we need a place where we can sh we can get some shelter we can get some rest where we can rejuvenate get rejuvenated and that is what is done by a home there's a difference between a home and a house house is the physical structure a home is not just the physical structure the physical structure plus the feelings of belonging of love of acceptance of safety that it all brings so because life is tough because there are so many threats that come upon us human beings across the world seek a shelter and <clears throat> when we seek a home basically that is, sometimes it is said have your feet on the ground some people just have too many fantastic ideas i'll do this and i'll do that and i'll do that says get your feet on the ground first so a home or a physical property is like where we put our feet on the ground it's grounded in reality if we look at the dreams most people have so many people from india come to the western world and say there's a great american dream is there a great british dream also <laughs> i don't know <laughs> but people talk about the great american dream so you know you have a you have a beautiful white house with a picket fence around it or whatever so we all have so people have this common human aspirations like that so the idea is that a home is a place where we get shelter <coughs> from life's attacks from life's anxieties and this is what in if we see in sanskrit or in uh, hindi marathi it's called as bhavan a bhavan is a home say so this is this that's a traditional word for a, a home so this is what the first point i'm going to make is we all need a shelter anywhere everywhere in the world this is one of the universal common aspirations of people we long for a shelter and while a home is an important shelter the second point i'll make is that the ultimate shelter is not in this world but is beyond this world unfortunately especially today there are many people who <clears throat> don't want to go home and there was a study done by the in the london school of economics when office becomes home so what happens nowadays people's relationships are dysfunctional you go home and then you have a spouse you don't know how to relate with them you have children who don't listen to you and at least in the office everything is well structured you know you give an order and it's followed uh, and you can be competent you can get work done you can get some returns from it so many people especially when their homes are troubled they prefer to stay in the office so now bhavan between bhavan and one the difference is bhav that bhav is for bhagwan so when god is not there in the home then the home the bhavan becomes like a one it becomes like a forest and when it's a forest in the forest or a jungle it's like the law of the wild it's survival of the fittest might is right so often uh, home instead of providing shelter it can actually cause tension it can cause anxiety especially when we don't get the sense of belonging we don't get the sense of uh, sense of comfort joy love <clears throat> and unfortunately this is happening more and more in the past we had joint families now we have nuclear families but now even that there is nuclear fission and even the nucleus is split and we have protons and neutrons orbiting around all alone so unfortunately many people don't experience shelter even in their homes and even if the home is comfortable even if there is shelter in the home still the shelter in this world is temporary even the best of shelters that we may get even if somebody the best of the homes still ultimately there is distress there is disease there is death and 
in the world the more we get shelter in something the more we feel the loss when the shelter is no longer there so somebody is a very close knit family and uh, most of us come all, i think all of you are from india or at least indian subcontinent so the family structure is quite strong over there so i was in a program in america a university program where one boy a student he came and he just looking a little grave after the during the program i said what happened he said my dad died yesterday oh really he said oh i'm sorry he said are you are you very disturbed by it he said no i saw him only two three times in my life what so what do you mean he says no uh, my mother and i were separated my mother and he were separated and uh, i didn't even know him so okay then do you stay with your mother he said no oh, what he said i i grew up in a foster home really i said why normally if somebody is orphan they go to foster home so he said actually when i was 5 my parents separated and the word divorce is also a very harsh word so now they use the word separate just separated it's as if you know two things were together they got separated <laughs> it went to soften it i was in canada and i was staying at a devotee's house so the the husband is a is a professional but he also does he's also a priest he does vivaha yag samskar and vivaha yagya like that so so he he does these uh, he does the he does marriage ceremony as a priest and his wife is a family lawyer now i ask what is family law mean he says that is a softer word for divorce litigation so <laughs> so then he was saying that we husband wife are a complete package you come to the husband for marriage you come to the wife for divorce <laughs> So now the point. So this boy said that when when I was five, my parents separated, and when they separated, both of them told me that this marriage was the biggest mistake of our life, of our life. And okay, sometimes you know, people don't get along. It's it's terrible, but it happens. But and but what what happened there after was, was I never heard of this. So both the parents told this boy, five-year-old boy. It is no. This marriage was the biggest mistake of our life, and you remind us of that mistake. So we don't want anything to do with you. And despite having both parents, this boy became an orphan. Such a horrible story. So what kind of shelter do people have? So generally, when we are in a close knit family, so when somebody is not in a close knit family, a loss doesn't feel like a loss also. Okay, I didn't even know my father. My daddy passed away. He died. Now, if we are in a close knit family, then when there is a loss, and we feel it very deeply. So, the more we get shelter in something in this world, the more if it is lost, we we feel greater pain because of that. So, what do we do? At one level, we need the shelter, isn't it? we need a home we need relationship we need stability but at the same time sometimes we don't get it and if we get it also then when we lose it it causes a lot of pain so what is sometimes when we lose a loved one it just uh, makes us question you know what, what is the what is the point of living you know we work so hard and doing things and suddenly i like can one moment just by say one blow a car hits somebody on the road or one bug one germ comes inside the body one blow or one one bang or one bug can you stand life now this is of course a very not a pleasant topic to talk about but it's a real topic so it may raise the question uh, what what is the point of it all when i was in my college actually i just finished my 10th and I was in the category top in the whole state of Maharashtra in India and then the day I got my 10th result that was the day uh, that evening my mother was diagnosed with blood cancer leukemia and 
within one month it was so advanced that although she was determined within less than a month it was all over so that time my father used to work in a different city so i was very close to my mother and that time so i started thinking what i didn't feel very comfortable even coming to my own home cuz it was all surrounded with memories of my mother at that time so then that's the time i started thinking now what is the nature of relationships what is the nature of love? what is the purpose of life that's when i started reading uh started reading more philosophical books then i read the bhagavad gita then uh, i eventually read the shrimad bhagavatam so in the bhagavatam in the fourth canto there is a beautiful story of prince dhruva many of you may know the story of how at the age of 5 he was insulted and his mother cuz they his father had to, the maharaj tanapad had two wives suruchi and suniti so because uh, suri suni suruchi was more attractive so the father was more attracted to her he neglected his other wife and her son so dhruva was neglected and insulted he felt infuriated and he said i was not allowed to sit on my father's lap i will get a throne bigger my father bigger than my father's throne and i'll sit on that but how he took that vow and he ran crying to his mother and at that time when he ran crying to his mother his mother a maid had seen that and she had run and already told what had happened now his mother was also helpless he said you know he said i want a kingdom bigger than my father's he said i can't help you in this but one person can who is that vishnu vishnu krishna he said and then there is a very significant verse he says vishnu can offer you more love than millions of mothers like me so now when i read this statement it was like a revelation sometimes when you think about spiritual life some many people renounce the world and they say all the relationships in this world are temporary they are illusory just this world is maya give it up but this verse when i read it he if vishnu can offer us love more than millions of more than what millions of mothers can that now if say the mother's love for a child or the love in this world or in this discussion the shelter that we get in our home now if that were simply maya maya in the sense that it's false then it is like zero then millions of times zero is how much zero still zero isn't it so if vishnu can offer us millions of times of love what a mother can offer that means the mother's love is also real but what vishnu can offer us is much much more so the love we get that if you consider that to be like a drop then the love that vishnu can give is like a ocean so what this means is that say if somebody is in the desert and they have no water at all even if they see a drop somewhere they will desperately go in that direction i want some water please that drop cannot actually fully quench our thirst but at least it something is better than nothing <coughs> and then maybe the drop gives us the hope i may get more water somewhere in this direction and then we can move forward in that direction so similarly when we talk about the love in the world that now many of us do if we come from loving families we we have experienced some love or the other and it is it is at a, quite a, if it is if you have experienced it deeply it is deeply fulfilling so the point here is not to dismiss the love of the world but to think that if a drop can give me so much shelter how much can the ocean give me that shelter and many of us may know this verse it has the same thing tvameva mata cha pita tvameva tvameva bandhuscha sakha tvameva tvameva vidya dravinam tvameva tvameva sarvam mam deva deva have any of you heard this verse before okay you also heard oh good do you know its meaning <laughs> okay thank you so what the verse says is you are my mother you are my father you are my sibling you are my friend you are my intelligence you are my wealth you o oh lord 
O God of Gods, you are my everything. Now, what does this mean? Sometimes we might just, some people take it literally. Like we say, Matru Deva Bho, Pitta Deva Bho. The mother is God, the father is God. Well, if it's literal, the mother is God and the father is God. Then say, once there was a court case. And what happened was, it is the mother and the father, the husband and my wife, wife and husband in the court. And the case was, the wife said, you know, I want my son to become a doctor. Uh, and the husband said, I want my son to become an engineer. He said, you know, why do you, why do you have to come to the court for this? Just ask your son. He says, no, we can't ask our son. He says, why not? He's not yet born. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> sometimes parents can have a full lifetime plan before the child is born also. <laughs> so now the mother and the father, literally they are God. Then, the, which God is the child supposed to follow? The mother God or the father God? And the mother God says, become a doctor. The father God says, become an engineer. So, it is not that the mother and father literally are God. They, they act as representatives of God. They act as channels through which God gives his love to us. So that means whatever love I have experienced from my mother, O oh Lord, it is your love experienced through her. When a baby is newborn, the mother offers her breast milk to the baby. And that is one of the most intimate acts of love. Certainly, the mother who offers his love has a lot of love for the baby. At the same time, the mother did not do anything special to, to produce milk in her breasts at that time. The same God who sent a child into the world through the mother's womb also sent milk in the mother's breasts for nourishing that child. So certainly the mother's love is there, but it's not only the mother's love. So Tameva Mata means that whatever love my mother has given me, yes, it is my mother's love, it is also God's love coming through my mother. And same way, say, when babies are very small, they need their mother the most. As they grow up, you know, they start looking towards their father also more. Then they have their siblings, then they have their friends. Then as they grow up, they study, they discover the power of knowledge. Then they earn wealth and they discover the power of wealth. They get some shelter in wealth. So whatever gives us shelter in the world, that is ultimately God giving us shelter through that. Same way, the home that gives us some shelter. Yes, if we have a home, it's a great relief, it's a great joy. So that shelter is there, but we understand it is God who is giving us that shelter. If we see it separate from God, if we see the mother's love, the father's love, the sibling's love, as separate from God, then if somehow that relationship ends, see somebody passes away, or sometimes sometimes some relationships turn bitter or misunderstandings happen, then we will feel completely shelterless. But if you understand, yes, it is God who is offering me love through this. And if there is an instrument, a person who has been an instrument for that love, we are grateful for that. But at the same time, we understand that the source is beyond. And sometimes, if, say, if this channel is blocked, that doesn't mean I have to live without any love in my life. The source is still there. I can connect with that source. Bhakti Yoga is the process for connecting with the source of all love. So we have horizontal relationships in the world and we have a vertical relationship beyond the world with God. <laughs> And so we need this, the vertical relationship is eternal. All the other relationships, they, they are very important while we are in the world, but they are temporary. So the way of living spiritually, spiritual, living spiritually doesn't mean that we don't care for the shelters in the world. Yes, the, while we are there, the shelters are important. And we, we care for the shelters, we take care of the shelters. But how a spiritually minded person lives, 
this is the third point the second point i spoke is that how we need a shelter beyond the world and god is that shelter but how the last point which i'll talk is how the shelter in this world can take us to the shelter beyond this world how the relationships that we have the home that we have the wealth that we have how all these can take us towards the source of all of these that is towards god <clears throat> the ground under us is normally a, a basic sense of security for us i was in new zealand a few months ago in wellington i was giving a class and suddenly everybody started shaking i said what happened he said there's an earthquake oh really and everybody was so calm I said, what happened? No, and I says, earthquake happens every week over here. <laughs> <laughs> they said, most earthquakes are so small that we don't even notice it. <laughs> so now, normally, for those of us who have not experienced it, earthquake is very alarming. The, the ground under us is like the basic sense of security. That starts shaking. What do you do? Where do you go? The sim the similarly, if we consider a bird on a tree, on a branch for the bird the branch is like the ground under it mm -hmm. now while the bird is on that branch the bird is sheltered by that branch but the bird does not live in mortal fear of the branch breaking why because the bird has faith in the power of its wings so right now the bird is on that branch and it is sheltered in that branch but the bird also has wings if this branch breaks the bird will immediately stretch its wings and fly so similarly for us the shelter in this world is like that branch so the shelter is important while we are there but while we are in any any shelter whether it's a home or it's a relationship we need to be developing our wings our wings our spiritual wings are our bhakti our relationship with krishna our devotion to krishna to the extent while acting according to our roles and responsibilities in the world while doing that when we practice bhakti when we uh, do some japa do some puja come for some satsang do some swadhyay when we practice the limbs of bhakti by all of these we are developing our relationship with krishna we are developing a connection with krishna and in in metaphorical sense we are developing our wings we are developing our wings and if by the end till we come to the end of our life krishna says at antakale cha mahameva smaran muktva kalevaram yaprayati samadbhavam yati nastyatve samshaya says antakale if at the time of death you remember me then you will attain me and you will never come to this temporary world again so this the beyond this world is a spiritual world and that is our eternal home that is where we as souls we are eternal god is eternal and the loving relationship between us and god is eternal so if by the end of our life we have developed our love for god so much that we love god more than the world then god will take us out of this world then we will attain his abode and thus for one who is practicing bhakti when death comes a devotee does not leave home a devotee goes home as the body will leave this world this is the body will leave this world and everybody has to do that but if the soul has developed love for god and the soul will go home to krishna so for us the home is a place where do we do get shelter at the material level and that's important but along with that the home is also the place where we develop the spiritual shelter where we strengthen our wings where we develop our bhakti 
so the bha in bhavan that is bhagavan that is god so when we bring god into our lives when we make him the center of our lives when we devote ourselves to him then the home in this world will take us will become a place by which we prepare our hearts so that we go to the home beyond this world so i'll summarize what i spoke and if any of you have any questions we can discuss after that so i spoke on the topic of how the home in this world can point us to the home beyond this world i started by first talking about how we all long for home although human beings are incredibly diverse in terms of their food their dress but everybody has a common aspiration for home a place where we retreat and rest and get rejuvenated amidst the many battles of life although we all want a home sometimes the home does not give us the promised shelter especially in today's world where our families are breaking down where relationships are becoming colder sometimes people feel homeless even at home and they just want to stay in office not even come at home or if somebody is very well sheltered at home the family is close knit then also when there is a loss the more we get a shelter in some sheltering the more we feel the loss when the shelter is lost so mm. therefore we need a shelter beyond the shelter of the home and what is that shelter that is the shelter of god I talked about how from my experience of the loss of my mother and then dhrumara story that vishnu can offer us more love than what millions of mothers can whatever shelter we get in the home in vishnu's abode we can get far greater shelter so tomeva mata cha tatomeva means that whatever love we get in this world if it's like a drop vishnu's love is like the ocean that it is a drop doesn't just mean it's insignificant it means that if a drop can also give us so much shelter then how much can the ocean give so the drop is meant to take us towards the ocean so whoever gives us any love it is ultimately not just that person giving love but it is vishnu krishna giving love through that person so we respect and reciprocate with the channel but we also recognize the source and we connect with the source and the the home becomes bhavan when there is bhagwan otherwise it is a one so when it bhagwan means that we practice bhakti to connect with krishna so the material shelters are important for the shelters in this world but they are also meant to prepare us to take shelter of the supreme lord and when we practice bhakti then we live in the material shelters like a bird living on a branch preparing its wings to fly whenever the branch breaks so if we practice bhakti and we develop our love for krishna if at the time of death our love for krishna is more than our love for the world then krishna will take us beyond this world to his abode and for a devotee when death eventually comes the devotee does not leave home but the devotee goes home thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna so any questions or comments so opportunity for you to clap all your doubts please do not be silent then don't tell me sorry i don't want to don't tell that this is time for you are asking questions this is one of the millions moments in our life coming to clear our doubts and go back to spiritual world you may don't want to go to spiritual world how to live comfortable in this world also you can ask questions so you can answer to that raise your hands or i have some questions Yeah. So for we you mentioned um that we should teach the soul how to love Krishna. From my understanding of the soul's natural position is to love Krishna. So what is it that we're actually trying to do? Is it Okay. So when I said that we need to learn to love Krishna or teach the soul to love Krishna, is it the soul's natural position to love Krishna? Uh, yes and no. what it means is that to love and be loved 
is the universal human longing not just universal human longing it was a universal longing of every living being even tigers in the jungles they love their cubs they love their mates so it's it's a longing of wherever there's consciousness however based on the kind of body and mind we have that love gets directed towards certain objects and sometimes the direction is is say for example when a mother loves a child that's natural and necessary for the child to especially in the early years to be able to survive and grow so prabhupad says that is natural necessary but that is not intrinsically spiritual unless the mother sees the child as a, as a gift of god as a soul who is a part of god who is entrusted by god in my care so we will naturally love but what we will love will depend on our consciousness depend on the kind of body and mind we have that means say if a if a person is born in a particular say if somebody is born in is not just people but even objects if somebody is born in south india whenever they think of food they think of idli sambar that's the food they think of if somebody is born in punjab they think of parathas so the love for food is natural but the expression may be specific so we all love certain things so in that sense to love is natural but presently that propensity to love is distributed and dissipated over many things so learning to love krishna what it means is that we acknowledge that there are many things attractive and i am attracted to them but the attractiveness of all these things is ultimately meant to point me to the all attractive source of everything so the love that is distributed and dissipated over various things that needs to be directed towards the source supreme source and that redirection is the process of bhakti so in that sense uh, bhakti yoga is not like learning in the sense that something we don't know but it's learning in the sense that something which we know but it is lost so deep inside us that we ourselves have forgotten it now sometimes it happens with me when i'm traveling you know if i have something which is very important maybe my passport or something like that i keep it very carefully and then i can't find it because <laughs> i kept it so carefully <laughs> that i don't know maybe i kept it so deep in a socket somewhere in a pocket <laughs> so we might lose something because we are careless and we place it somewhere or we might we lose something because it's so deep that it's lost so we could say love for krishna is so deep in the heart that there are so many other impressions because of which it is it is almost inaccessible to us so we have to reawaken reaccess that love which is very deep within the hearts and then we will be able to connect with krishna lovingly okay thank you yes um, thank you for the wonderful class um maybe it's an extension to his question i think yeah. is about the experience of uh, this love to god hmm. um is it something that we can only experience once as you say we are preparing for it but once we lose ground and then we still think about krishna and we get to the place to experience it or is something that we can experience even in this present life in material life? okay <laughs> so is love for krishna something we experience only when we go to him or can we experience it now also it's incremental so first of all uh, we also need some amount of knowledge to experience to understand that i am experiencing love say for example when a baby is very newborn the baby doesn't even understand that this person is my mother for the baby okay this is just some soft substance and something from the some soft something soft and nice comes from that and i'll drink that and that's all but gradually as the baby grows the baby starts becoming aware oh this is my mother and she loves me and she cares for me say the baby is baby is sleeping and suddenly it becomes very cold and the baby's eyes are closed and the baby is shivering and the mother notices my baby is shivering and the mother puts a comforter 
now the baby has not opened her eyes to see the mother there but just by experiencing the relief from the cold the baby knows oh, this must be my mother she has put this comfort on me so there it's a inference from an experience the baby may not even think like this but it's inference from an experience so similarly for us our eyes are closed right now like that baby so we can't we don't really perceive god at our present state but we can experience relief just like now just like i say the when the comforter is put you feel relief like that when we remember god say when we come to a temple when we worship the lord when we sing some songs when we do some kirtan then we experience some relief even people who are skeptics if they go to a temple or they come to go to a holy place they experience something special over there i feel peaceful here they they don't necessarily attribute it to the deity, deity in the temple this but something is there over there some vibes so for us primarily that experience of relief from anxiety from distress from agitating desires that is our experience of god and as we keep growing spiritually that experience will become more and more the shrimad bhagavatam says bhakti pareshanubhava viraktir anyatrach bhakti is a process when we follow this process it gives us para ish anubhav experience of that lord who is beyond this world he can't be experienced simply by the senses but is experienced by a devoted heart and the result of that experience is viraktir anyatrach other experiences don't trouble us so much so this experience is so rich and fulfilling that other experiences okay it doesn't matter so that relief is our experience of god and if we have knowledge then from that experience that experience we can infer make the inference that this is god's love being experienced and as we keep practicing bhakti more and more then gradually this experience of relief will become more and more frequent and not only that beyond that we start experiencing our spiritual eyes will start awakening and then then we more and more perception of god but this experience relief experience of relief and shelter is definitely something we can experience in this world also okay thank you thank you this room when we live together someone space with krishna bhakti and someone very new for that especially when we make a close relationship when you say the other person can you do what i am doing the other person says you are right i am appreciate what you doing but i am not ready for that you don't force me and the person in distress but the person knows that the relation knows is in distress is a solution for him but he couldn't say but the how to convey the person for the fires to inspire more to krishna communities because everybody think krishna is something so different i know i lay my puja or my father that my grandfather that what you something new like i'm telling me so mm. how is the different situations yes so if we have a family member or relative who who knows the krishna consciousness is good but they feel like it is too much and they don't want to practice but they're in distress and practice of bhakti can give them relief but they're not they say i'm not ready for it then what do we do at that time yeah this is a universal question maybe 20 20, 20 or so years ago when i started practicing bhakti first more than 20 years ago so at that time i naturally wanted my father and others to practice so i asked one of uh, uh, the sanyasis at that time now how do i get my father also to start practicing bhakti so he replied by letting anyone except you preach to him <laughs> you don't preach to him so why because what happens we all have our particular relationship and the dynamics of that relationship so normally say in a traditional culture the father 
is not really ready to learn from the sun. So, and that's what I did. I got out of the way. I connected with my father with say devotees of his age group, of his socio uh, cultural background and everything. And he became much more receptive over a period of time. So sometimes uh, the dynamic of our relationship with that person becomes the filter through which they perceive Krishna. Hmm? And then they may not be averse to Krishna Bhakti, but that what our particular relationship that becomes a filter which causes them to hesitate. So in general, uh, yes, naturally if we are practicing Krishna Bhakti and we experience some relief, some shelter in that, we want others also to experience that shelter. That's natural. At the same time, we need to recognize that we can't control anyone. Even Krishna doesn't control anyone. Krishna has given everyone free will. So in general, all of us, one human being can, exp ex can influence another human being only in three broad ways. The door to personal change is a door that can be opened only from inside. Nobody can force anyone to change. It is that person has to take, feel inspired to change. So what we can do is from outside, we can provide three broad things. I call it as uh, <clears throat> enlightenment, engagement and encouragement. Enlightenment means that we try to explain to them, give them the knowledge to see the consequences of their actions. Rather than telling them do this, try to help them see what will you happen if you do this and what will happen if you do this. So often we can see it very clearly, but they can't see it because they don't have that knowledge. So rather than giving a prescription of what they should do, give them the knowledge by the vision, knowledge that gives them the vision to see what will happen when they do something. So that's enlightenment. The second is engagement. Engagement means, say if, for example, if I want you to do this, but then how can you do this? So, like say in my father's case, you know, I wanted my father to practice, but he needed a proper environment where he could do that. That was his say, age group. So if we want our spouse or our children or our uh, siblings to practice bhakti, then we have to see how can they be engaged with their current interests, with their current level. Maybe they like music. So we want them to come for satsang, but they're not ready to come for satsang. But if there's a, there is a spiritual kirtan program, they are happy to come for that. Sometimes some people, they will come to a temple, but no, oh, there was, uh, where was it? I think it was in Adelaide in Australia. There was one devotee couple. So the Mataji, uh, would, if she would eagerly come for the programs. The husband would come to the temple, but would not come to the lecture. And he would just wait for her outside in the car. And when the program would get over, he would come over. And he would come and take her back. So for one and a half, two hours, he would just be in the car. He said, I'll not come to the temple. He said, I don't, I don't, want, I don't want, to, want to be lectured at. Then, one day, what happened was that while he was sitting in the car, some, something, something like a, a prasadam truck or something came from outside. And then the devotee who was getting that whole prasadam or plates or whatever is out, he was alone and he was doing that and he looked, this, devotee was, this person was sitting in the car he says can you help in this he said of course yeah and then he took that and he came inside and then this devotee said you know we are understaffed can you serve prasad today and he said yes and then this this my wife she came out and her husband was serving her prasad <laughs> she was surprised what happened <laughs> He said, I, <laughs> I invited so many times, he never came. So then, then he liked that. And then after that, he would still be in the car, whenever the lecture was going on. But whenever Prasadam would start, he would come to serve the Prasad. <laughs> <laughs> so he had that taste for doing some service, but not for lecture. So what happened was that sometimes people may not be ready to take the complete package. 
and if we present Krishna consciousness like a one zero thing, now either you do this, you have to do everything. But sometimes they might just want to take one part of the package, and that's also okay. So he was ready to do seva, and now he started meeting devotees and talking with devotees. And then one, there was one devotee who would serve prasad with him regularly. And then one day this devotee said, "Today I am giving the class." He said, "Oh really? You are giving? You, know, you are such a nice person. I'll come for the class." And he came because they were they were friends. He came for the class and he liked the class. And now that Prabhu has become a preacher, <laughs> so he gives classes. <laughs> so it happened gradually. So basically, engagement means that rather than telling people do things, this look at their circle of interest. You say this is the circle of interest. Find out where their circle of interest intersects with the bhakti circle. And rather than telling them do all this, just okay, can you do this one thing? Yeah, maybe they can. That's engagement. And third is encouragement. Encouragement means that even when, if we know that something is the right thing to do, often mm, it is the way we tell them. Sometimes instead of appreciating people when they do a small thing, we as soon as they do one small thing, we immediately they tell them, "I have to do. Now you do this." I was in Dubai, and I was with one family, and their daughter was telling, "My parents are never satisfied with whatever I do." I said, really? I said, "No, we are very happy with whatever you do." That's why do you feel like this? So she said that she gave an example that one day she chanted four rounds, and so then I told my mother that I chanted, I chanted this four round japa. She said, "Mother said yes." Now soon you should start sixteen rounds. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of appreciating her for what she was doing, he just like put another standard. So we need to encourage others. That means, you know, what they are doing, appreciate them for that. Even if it's a small step, appreciate them and inspire them. So by our example, by our words, if we inspire them, then what happens? Even if they take small steps, they feel appreciated. They feel valued. If they take one step and they feel this is just a build up for many a pile up of more expectations from me, <laughs> then they say I don't want to get into this only. So just appreciate them. So when you have to do those three things: enlightenment, engagement, and encouragement. Then we basically open the door for them to walk through. And even if they don't walk through the door, we keep the door open, and one day they will walk through. Okay. Okay. Hare Krishna. It's a question. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare you Krishna. mentioned Krishna shows his love through any mother or father. How do you make sure you don't fall in the trap of being getting too attached to that mother or father? How do you kind of realize that love is from Krishna? How do we not fall into the trap of getting too attached to our parents and we remember that that love is coming from Krishna? Mm, it's not so black and white. It's uh, it's not that to be spiritual, we stop being human. See, our spirituality is meant to expand our humanity, not diminish our humanity. So it's natural, as a, as a human being, uh, we all need relationships. And uh, in India, we often talk about if we are in the spiritual mind, we talk about attachment. Don't become too attached. To someone, and that's valuable. But you know, uh, at one level, you could say <clears throat> there's a thin line. There's a thin line separating. You can come ahead if you like. You can come ahead. There's a thin line separating. There's a thin line separating attachment and commitment. It's often only when a person is is emotionally invested in a relationship will they be ready to do sacrifices that are often required to sustain that relationship, to enrich, to deepen that relationship. So, in, we shouldn't. So, when is it attachment and when it is when is it actually commitment? Because commitment is needed in every relationship. Without commitment, relationships just crumble. So 
<clears throat> broadly speaking commitment is emotional investment attachment is emotional dependence if we are not emotionally invested in the relationship then we just can't as i said sacrifice for the relationship and every relationship requires sacrifice but uh, when we are when there is attachment that means there is emotional dependence that means our very existence depends on that other person's approval now if that person is unhappy then it's like my whole life is in tatters now of course we don't want to make anyone intentionally unhappy but sometimes because we are finite beings and we have individual interests so we may not be able to do something that the other person wants us to do and sometimes the other person may also be conditioned and they may want us to do something which is actually harmful for us or which may not be so good for us so if we are emotionally dependent on that person then just to please them or just to not displease them we will go to any extremes to do whatever they want us to do and that is unhealthy so basically uh, emotional dependence means that we want to please the other person whatever the cost and sometimes we may do unethical things we may do things which are harmful for ourselves and sometimes harmful for the other person also just because we are attached we do that thing for them so what we can do is keep the bigger picture in mind that means that any every relationship is important but ultimately life has a purpose so we exist not just in one relationship but in a network of relationships and we exist in a network of relationships and we are on a journey of spiritual evolution spiritual evolution means our consciousness expands till we ultimately develop love for krishna so we need to have our purpose clear what is the purpose of my life what is the most important thing in my life when we have that purpose clear it is purpose that gives perspective perspective means this is more important this is less important so for ex- uh, so if something more important is prominent in our mind then we can say no to that which is less important say for example if in if one evening somebody invites us for a party now we are not really interested in going for that party but if we are not doing anything special in that evening then to say no to that person will be difficult but if you are already going for some other program say actually you know i am i have already fixed for book for that program so i can't go. so when we already are saying yes to something then saying no to something else becomes easier so similarly if we uh, we are purposefully focused on our spiritual evolution that means we want to grow towards krishna and we want to help others grow towards krishna and of course on the journey we want to be with each other and we want to support each other but we don't want that horizontal relationship to be at the cost of other horizontal relationships or the cost of the vertical relationship with krishna so when we have that purpose clear the purpose will give us perspective and perspective means yes this person is asking this from me i do this it's difficult but i do this because i care for this person but perspective also means if this person asks this this is too much you know if i do this it will hurt me it will hurt them it will be counterproductive so if we understand this difference then we can move forward so basically um, we need to be emotionally invested but we don't need to be emotionally dependent and if we are connected with krishna and sheltered in krishna by the practice of bhakti yoga regularly then we have a basic emotional security coming from our connection with krishna and then we are not so emotionally needy for that person's approval because our emotion now we do need relationships krishna alone is not for most of us is not enough we need a community around us but 
if we are too emotionally dependent on someone then that person can manipulate us so if we are connected with krishna and sheltered in krishna a basic level of emotional security is there then if a particular relationship if a particular situation requires us to say no to someone uh, then we can say no to that we don't get we don't feel it's like my life is falling apart uh, when we say no to someone so when, attachment basically means inability to say no no matter what the cost is mm -hmm. so that attachment can be avoided if we are connected with krishna and we have a broader understanding of the purpose of our life okay thank you the last question okay yeah so you know in a relationship when you have devotees who are also uh, your siblings and um, mother and parents and stuff how do you avoid offenses yet keep that human natural relationship with them <laughs> 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 Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, if our family members are also devotees, then how can we avoid offending them while at the same time you know, doing what is natural in that relationship? Yeah. Firstly, we have to understand what is an offense. It is, see, offense is like an elastic word. Elastic means it can have many different meanings. Aparad in Sanskrit, we call it. At one level, it is said in the Bhakti literature that if you see a devotee and you are not happy on seeing that devotee, then that's an offense. <laughs> now, there are some devotees, we feel unhappy on seeing them. <laughs> Why is this person here? <laughs> now, it's just the way life is. And sometimes we, we, we get along with some people. And sometimes we just don't get along with some people. As they say, some people bring happiness wherever they go. And some people bring happiness whenever they go. <laughs> so, and some, sometimes the devotees may also be like that. Some devotees. So, offense, that's, it's an offense but it's like a minor offense. The idea is we should be happy when we see somebody devoted to Krishna. But they are devoted to Krishna, but sometimes how they are devoted to Krishna is not as important for us how they are, as how they are interacting with me. And if we have, un we have unpleasant interactions, then that's what dominates our consciousness. So that's understandable. The really serious offenses are where out of envy we are trying to pull down the other person. That means when somebody is praised, somebody is appreciated, and then Hey, oh, you think he or she is so great? Actually, they are not so great. You know what they did? You know what they did like that? So, when somebody is being glorified and you pull them down. Mm -hmm. Say, somebody does very nice kirtan or somebody gives very nice classes and everybody is glorifying them. You are such a nice devotee. And then somebody says, you know how much prasad he eats? <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> try to, somebody is being praised and you try to pull them down. <laughs> that, of course, this is also not a very serious offense, but this is an indication of the direction. When we consciously try to pull down someone, that is a very serious offense. In between could be say sometimes, you know, we shout at someone, we yell at someone. Mm. Now, that is not, you could say at one level, good, even in a normal relationship, or to speak of a devotee relationship. But is yelling at someone an offense? No, sometimes in the heat of the emotion we might speak some things. And it's good if we can avoid that. But we can't live in paranoia. Constant fear. Oh, I'll commit an offense, I'll commit an offense. We have to, sometimes our emotions also need a vent. We need to express ourselves. It's not a license to yell at each other. <laughs> My point is simply that we all have certain human emotions and they need to be expressed at times. You can try to express them in a regulated way, but still they need expression. So if you consider this elasticity of the term of offense, so certainly with our relatives or loved ones, we won't be in that trying to pull them down intentionally. So in that sense, generally we are not offensive to them. 
so but at the intermediate level uh, if in the heat of the moment sometimes we speak something mm -hmm. so if our uh, some speak something which we should not have spoken maybe it's offensive the other person feels hurt or whatever so at that time uh, that particular interaction will be painful and we may also regret it later but you know relationships are not just shaped by one word or one sentence, one interaction it's like a whole series of interactions if overall we are respectful we are responsible we are loving then even if something harshly spoken it it, it will not be taken so seriously hmm. i have written a book on the ramayana in which i talk about human relationships based on the ramayana so when when ram had gone to see a uh, chase marichi seek mari uh, that word come as a deer and then that Maricha turned in Maricha turned into a uh, that deer turned into Maricha and he screamed, Oh Sita, oh Lakshman, oh Sita, help! In the voice of Ram. So at that time Sita desperately told Lakshman, go and help. And Lakshman said, Ram is not in danger. He said, This is the demon impersonating. He says, No, Ram is in danger, go. And Sita at that time was so frantic with worry that finally she somehow wanted to board Lakshman to go. And she accused Lakshman. No, I know why you are not going. You want Ram to die so that you can enjoy, you can have me for yourself. He says, I will die rather than be touched by you. And she just went on a tirade accusing Lakshman. And Lakshman had never even thought like that. Those words were unbearable for him. He just went away because of those words. And he said, oh Sita, you don't know what you are saying out of anger. But still the words you are speaking are not are unbearable for me. And he left from there. Now of course a disaster happened. Ravana came and kidnapped her. But eventually, when Lakshman had to fight to get Sita back, Lakshman did not say hey, to Ram, you know, she spoke those words to me, I am not going to fight you. <laughs> <laughs> or even when they were reunited, Lakshman did not tell you. You are not apologized till now. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, what don't see intention in what is spoken intention. <laughs> <laughs> don't see intention in what is spoken intention. So, sometimes intention when you speak some words. So don't, don't hold it too much against people. Of course, again, as I said, this is not a license to speak whatever we want. We do need to discipline ourselves. But in general, relationships are dynamic. And sometimes, if we care very deeply for something, we might speak strongly about it. So if overall, our purpose is to serve Krishna, and with that purpose, we try to act, then even if we go off track, we'll come back on track. So... In the purpose of serving Krishna, sometimes we might do confront, you know, I want to do it this way, you want to do it this way. We may, we may put our case very forcefully. And sometimes one choice has to be done. And the other person may be unhappy because of that. Well, that's just the way life is. So we don't have to live in paranoia. But still we have to be conscious. Okay? Thank you. So thank you very much. Yeah. So generally, uh, in Hinduism, we are from different backgrounds. And in many, many shlokas, sasra say that many gods, many gods. But the only iskani words only talk about Krishna. They don't care about other people, other gods. So how it is, uh, how can we believe in only Krishna, not in everybody? Because many, many shlokas say many gods. But we there is only one god. How does he clarify this doubt for them? It's a long question. <laughs> okay. So in Hinduism talks about many gods. In Krishna consciousness we talk about Krishna is only God. Well, not exactly. We also accept that there are devatas. Not that we say only Krishna, that there are many worshipable beings. At the same time, we follow Shastra, and Shastra, the Bhagavad Gita, for example, gives us a hierarchy. Basically, <coughs> so, you know, much of current Hinduism has emerged as an intersection, much of current Hinduism has emerged as an intersection of 
say traditional understanding of scripture and western interpretation of scripture so when the western people came to india they had certain categories there's monotheism and polytheism so their idea was monotheism is judaism christianity islam these abrahamic religions there's one god that's like a cardinal belief in them and before that was the greco roman tradition the romans had many gods they had they they imaged many nature nature natural entities to be uh, natural forces to be governed by certain gods so they had this idea of this dialectic this two categories monotheism or polytheism and when they came to india they they tried to interpret hinduism in terms of that now they say oh you worship so many gods this polytheistic but then they found that actually it's not that simple so the word technically if you want to use it what hinduism has is not monotheism is not polytheism it's actually polymorphic monotheism what does it mean <laughs> morpha is form poly is many so monotheism is one god but polymorphic monotheism that means one god who manifests in many forms and actually it is not even polymorphic monotheism because in our tradition god is not just one person god is a divine couple god is not just ram it is sita ram god is not just krishna it is radha krishna so it is not even polymorphic monotheism it is polymorphic by monotheism <laughs> there is one god who manifests as a divine couple so the idea is that there is one supreme being but it is not a one zero thing that if you cannot worship god then you can worship the, if you cannot worship the one supreme being then there are many other beings you can worship and those other beings also worshiping them can also elevate one so it's like there is a hierarchy of progression so in 720 to 23 in the bhagavad gita krishna talks about this that say if a child say if a father has two children and one of them barely passes the exam say the one son just gets 40% marks barely passes the other person is very good gets 80% marks and today both of them have come with their results and both of them have got 60% the first son comes in and says i have got 60% and the father says shabash well done and the second son says i have got 60% badmash what have you done <laughs> You also got sixty percent. Why are you calling me Badma? <laughs> so now, for somebody who is at forty percent, sixty percent is a big step up. For somebody who is at eighty percent, sixty percent is a step down. So similarly, in the scriptures, yes, there is glorification of the worship of the devtas also. And so, for somebody who is <clears throat> either materialistic or atheistic. It's like they are at forty percent, and they start worshiping a devta that is rising to sixty percent, and that is good. So shabash. So if somebody, as compared to a materialist, is worshiping a devta, that is very good. They are at least pious. They are at least religious. But if somebody can have the proper philosophical understanding by which they can worship Krishna, then that is like they are at the eighty percent level. And from there, if they start worshiping any other, the various devtas. Then that's like from eighty percent coming down to sixty percent. So the idea when we are sharing Krishna bhakti is that we are following scripture and we respect the various gods and we respect their potency also. Their worship also has results. However, it's a progression. So somebody who can come to eighty percent, uh, they needn't stay at sixty percent. But somebody who is at forty percent and they come to sixty percent, that is laudable. So if somebody is if we have this inclusive understanding of a progression then we will see we will see where a person fits and encourage them gradually to rise up from there okay thank you so thank you very much shri prabhupada ki thank you so much